A nation will accept no religion which is utterly and entirely alien to its nature, even if it is forcibly imposed. Certain favorable responsive conditions must be to hand. When the ground is not in some way prepared beforehand, a strong and brutal power may obtain an outward superficial appearance, but will never compel the roots to strike deeper. And Christianity struck root, not merely in the superficial strata, but in the deeper substrata of northern feeling even if it did not succeed in reaching all the strata. Certain spiritual conditions must therefore have paved the way for its reception. All the mythological polytheism had been unable to destroy a certain fatalistic disposition, monotheistic in its tendency, which existed in the composition of the northern mind. Indeed, this disposition grew more pronounced and finally led to a twilight of the gods, to the downfall of the old polytheistic spectral conception of the gods, and in their stead was born the gloomy, inexorable, fateful power of the Norns. The development thus pressed on towards monotheism, and as Christianity, with its worship of saints and martyrs, presented a certain substitute for those polytheistic needs, which had not as yet been completely suppressed, the exchange of mythological for Christian ideas was well prepared for. For the North, Christianity's greatest persuasive power lay in its systematic structure. It was the completeness of the Christian system which conquered the unsystematic Northern man with his chaotic, nebulous mysticism. Northern man lacked the requisite energy for the independent construction of a fixed form for his transcendental needs. His spiritual powers were consumed by inward strife and therefore never attained to any unified achievement. The desire for action gave out with the fatigue of overcoming so many obstacles, and what remained was only a melancholy feeling of impotence, which longed for the bewilderment of intoxication. Until he had attained inner maturity, this consciousness of weakness made northern man powerless to resist any complete system imposed upon him from without, whether it was Roman law or Christianity. And when, as in Christianity, chords vibrated in unison with his own distraught nature, when his uncertain, nebulous, transcendental ideas were met by a wonderfully constructed and logical system of a cognate, transcendental character, this system was bound to have a convincing effect on him, overriding and suppressing any slight resistance. The longing to come to rest in a fixed form could not but overcome any discrepancies between his own and the alien ideas. The subject matter, content, and secondary features of his own ideas were subordinated to the alien concepts and then adapted to the new form more rapidly than could have been believed of the dull northerner. Nevertheless, the Christian system always remained merely a substitute for the form which northern man could not previously create by his own energy. There could therefore be no question of an absolutely complete absorption into Christianity, and when the North, tempted by the form ready to hand, had succumbed to it, many parts of its being remained excluded from this form which it had not itself created. To find an appropriate form for his dualistic hybrid nature, to systematize his chaotic yearning for ecstasy, this was reserved for the highest point in the development of Northern man, the mature Gothic. Christian scholasticism, and in a far higher degree Gothic architecture, these only were the proper realizations of this northern will to form, which was so hard to satisfy. For the present we may be satisfied with finding the fact of his acceptance of Christianity confirming our verdict on the character of northern man, reached solely by way of the psychological analysis of the style manifested in his earliest artistic efforts. For this enabled us to know the nature of the will to form which is adequate for his relationship to the outer world, and which consequently determines all the manifestations of his life.